that. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, everybody. So today I'm going to talk to you about the uncertainties involved with making predictions about the future and how we can use Monte Carlo probability simulations to give us a better understanding of these uncertainties and to help us make better, more informed risk-based decisions. So how do we deal with uncertainties in predictions in day-to-day -day life? Let's take the following scenario. We've got Scotland playing Germany in a game of football here. And I'm going to press you and ask you who you think is more likely to win, with the caveat of if you get it wrong, you're going to lose a fiver. Okay. I think most people in here would choose Germany. The reason for this is because you've used a semi-quantitative analysis where you don't know the exact data, but in the back of your mind, you know that you've seen Germany win quite a few games. And we've all, we've all had our hearts broken one too many times watching Scotland play football. So this is, this is a great tool, it's a great method when we've got to make lots of decisions and when the stakes, remember you're losing a fiver, aren't that high. So let's take the next scenario where we have two teams here from the top Cameroonian uh, football league. I'm not even going to attempt to, to pronounce their names. Hopefully we don't have any Cameroonian sports fans in the room. The idea I'm trying to get across is that in this instance, we're quite bamboozled. We don't know the outcome. And it makes it even harder when I tell you that your life depends on this decision. So how do we give ourselves more information to make a decision like this? So I'm going to introduce the concept of probability, which is simply the amount of times something happens as a fraction of the total amount of times it could have happened. So explained using a set of dice here. Each die has numbers 1 to 6 on its six sides. So the lowest number we can roll is a 2, and the highest we can roll is a 12. So that's our range. Now, do we have an equal chance of rolling each number within that range? Well, the answer is no. And the reason for that is, as I've shown here, these are all of the combinations. There's 36 total combinations that can make up each number. And you can see there's only one that makes whereas there's six that can give you a seven. So we've got a one in 36 chance of rolling a two and around about a 17% chance of rolling a seven. So if I was to ask you again, you'd probably choose a seven. But it's worth noting that there's an 83% chance that I will not roll a seven. Okay, so back, back to our scenario here. What I've done is taken some statistical calculations I've found on some dodgy gambling websites. And what they do is they let me calculate the probability of each team scoring zero to five goals based on previous, uh, previous data from previous games. So the numbers are a bit small, but what we can see is the most likely outcome, the most probable outcome, is a score of 2-1. So we would choose the team on the left. Now, this might not end up being the case, and that's how gambling, the companies make their money. Um, but this, this has allowed us, it's given us some quantitative justification for making that really difficult decision. So how can we use this in integrity? How does it apply to integrity? Let's take some corrosion-based failure as an example. We've got here a cross-section of a pressurized pipe or vessel. It's got internal and or external coatings. Once they go, we've got a nominal or original wall thickness, which is going to get eaten away by our internal and external corrosion rate until we reach a failure criteria, which I've used MAWT in this minimum allowable wall thickness in this case. So what we want to know, what we want to predict, is how long it's going to take before we reach that failure criteria. So what we usually do is a remaining life or a remnant life calculation where we take the current wall thickness, take away the failure criteria, and divide that by corrosion rate. 
So plotted on a graph, well, simply, let's say we start with eight millimeters per uh, wall thickness, sorry. We're corroding at one millimeter per year. Failure criteria is three mils. We'll get there in five years. Great. But remember, we're actually more likely to not roll a seven. So it's probably more likely that it will not fail at five years. Why is this? Well, mainly it's down to the fact that those input values that we've put there have some uncertainties around them. So what do I mean by this? Let's take the corrosion rate. I've said I think it's one millimeters per year. However, in this scenario, I've actually seen corrosion rates up to 1.5, maybe as low as 0.5. The original wall thickness due to milling tolerances, inspection tolerance pointed that down to eight millimeters. In this, let's say in this case, it's as high as nine, as low as seven. Once I add in these uncertainties together, you start to see that we no longer have this definite failure point of five years. We actually have this range building up. When I put in some uncertainties surrounding the failure criteria, our range goes from three mils, sorry, three years to seven years. And actually what we see is that our inputs, instead of being defined discrete numbers, are actually very like our dice probability distributions, meaning that our output will be a probability distribution in itself. So how can we take account of this? How can we calculate this? So Monte Carlo simulation, this is a bit of my mouth pill, so I'll read it out. <laughs> um, it's a mathematical tool that physically simulates all possible events that lead to a phenomenon, in this case, time to failure, and calculates the effects that the variance and uncertainty of the input information has on that output phenomenon. So it's basically described as a mathematical model of the phenomenon. Just for comparison's sake, our inputs for remnant life, those discrete values, we put them in the calculator, we get a definite discrete value out of five years. Monte Carlo, we're going to use, take all our uncertainties, put them in as uh, probability distributions, the tool will basically churn out thousands of calculations to see how all of these interact with each other. And it gives you this really useful graph of probability against time to failure. So let's see it in motion. We've got here a carbon steel vessel. It's externally coated, internally lined. And what we're going to do is some wall thickness checks on it. At this point here, we find that we've had some wall thinning. And we want to know how long it's going to take for that wall to get to our failure criteria. Typical remnant life inputs, we measured it at 17 millimeters. Uh, we're saying the external coating will last for an extra three years. Um, once it fails, the external corrosion rate will be 0.15 millimeters per year. Internal corrosion rate, 0.5 millimeters per year. For the Monte Carlo simulation, We'll put in our probability distributions. I've just taken some simple ones here where I've put in our inspection tolerances around the original wall thickness, um, some uncertainties surrounding the time to coating failure, external corrosion rate, and internal corrosion rate. And these, dis these distributions can come in all shapes and sizes depending on the scenario. So our output from this looks a little something like this, where we can see this peak in the middle here, around about 60 months, is essentially our seven. It's our most likely uh, combination that, that leads to that failure. However, in order for us to get to that stage, all of the events that happened before it have to have not happened. So essentially what I want to know is what's the probability of rolling anything less than or equal to a seven. So what we do is we transform this into a cumulative probability graph. So this shows how our probability accumulates over time. We start here at liftoff, 
around about 25 months, and then we rise up to 100% probability of failure around about 150 months there. And I'm going to plot my remnant life calculation on there as, as an example. Essentially, what this remnant life calculation is, is an extremely accurate S-curve where we're extremely 100% sure about all of our inputs that they're the same, uh, sorry, that they're correct. So actually, the more uncertain I am about the calculation, the wider this S-curve gets. So let's say we can't get into this vessel until 50 months. Using a remnant life, we have a check there, it'll be fine. Whereas looking at the Monte Carlo curve, we can see that we've actually got a 10% probability of failure at this stage. That becomes even more interesting when that gets deferred to 100 months. Don't pay too much attention to the values. It's just an example. But Usually, we would do a risk assessment, say yes or no, whether we think that it's okay to defer to 100 months. Would we make the same decision if we knew there was a 90% probability of failure by that stage? Now, these S-curves are really useful for comparison. So what I can do is I can plot several of these relating to, let's say, several defects on the one, uh, on the one item. Uh, several sections of pipework, several corrosion circuits, systems. Just as an example, I've taken five systems here. And it gives you a really good visual representation of the condition of the items in, in question. And it, it makes it really easy to look at what you need to target for inspection or for maintenance, etc. So. We'll take another scenario where we've been told that cessation of production is at 100 months. Now, this is a really fluid date, as, as Fran will explain about later in her talk. Um, so as that date moves, it's really useful to see how your probabilities change. But leading up to that, it's good to see which systems you want to target. And once you start taking consequence into consideration here, for example, it becomes even more interesting. So let's say this dark blue line here, it's a no-brainer. It's at 90% at cessation of production. We want to be getting after that before this purple one at 19%. Might not make the same decision if this is safety critical and the dark blue one isn't. So. Where have we and where can we use this? High profile equipment ending near, uh, nearing end of field life. As I was saying, that date's quite fluid. Equipment that's inaccessible or expensive to inspect. So in this case, you probably don't have much, if any, uh, inspection data. So to pinpoint numbers and tell yourself how much longer that that equipment's going to um, live last for, um, it's, it's quite difficult. So to accept that you have uncertainties in that, you're actually giving yourself more information. It's more useful. Systems, items subject to deferral. This again goes with our, our changing date and seeing how those probabilities change. Uh, lastly, calc any calculations with notable uncertainties. Monte Carlo is a method that's used extensively in the nuclear industry, construction, finance, even for well exploration. So it's a, it's a well-known and well-established tool. And in my mind, we should be making more use of it to give us more information. So I'd like to thank you for your time. <laughs>